What up, fools? Matt Farah here. It's the Watch and Listen podcast, along with Mr. Cameron Weiss, the real smart one, the CEO of the Weiss Watch Company, making mechanical watches from scratch here in Los Angeles, California. This episode of the Watch and Listen podcast is brought to you by Crown and Caliber. Crown and Caliber is uh, the number one destination for secondhand luxury watches online. Don't be a fool. Don't buy new. Don't pay retail. Watches get generally much uh, better taken care of than cars. They're easier to service. They uh, they don't get as damaged. And buying used is a great way to get into the game. Almost 100% of my watches are were bought used. And the ones that weren't, Cameron made. Uh, and so uh, uh, Crown & Caliber is, uh, is a good spot to do that. They also just became uh, an official, uh, I think it's official, dealer for uh, Oris watches. They've got some new Oris watches down there. But they also have the gold standards like Rolex, Omega, AP. There's some Paddock in there. There's uh, a bunch of other brands. I'm blanking right now because I'm under pressure. But uh, crownandcaliber.com. Use code CAM150, C-A-M-150, to get $150 off your first watch purchase from Crown and Caliber. That's code CAM150. Uh, we are also sponsored by Beeline Coffee. I'm drinking it right now. That's why I'm zooming the Roasted Tire 2.0. The new blend uh, for my personal collab with uh, Beeline is now out. Uh, you can t- dif- uh, differentiate it from the 1.0 version with the Porsche on the label instead of my old Mustang. But uh, it's a, it is a completely b- different blend. It's from Honduras instead of uh, Costa Rica. It's from high up in the mountains, 1,800 meters elevation. It is absolutely delicious part of my quest to make the most delicious coffee out there. And uh, man, it is super, super, super good. Use code CHRONO, C-H-R-O-N-O, to get uh, 15% off your entire order at BeelineCoffee.com. That's code CHRONO for 15% off your entire order at BeelineCoffee.com. All right, in this episode, uh, as promised, this one was, uh, was actually... We, we, we threw it out there, and the fans were about it, so here we did it. Uh, Cameron went to Switzerland for a trade show that shows uh, machinery that you use to make watches. So it's a real insidery thing, um, and he brought back a bunch of pictures and video of uh, these really weird and cool machines that watchmakers and watch factories would, uh, would buy to make, uh, automate, clean, and do all this different stuff. It's a really neat show, so this is a good one. It's the Watch and Listen podcast. Here we go. What's up, folks? Watch and listen podcast. Here it is. We back. Although, actually, it's more like we still here because (laughs) we recorded last episode just a minute ago. Astute viewers would notice our clothes haven't changed. Uh, welcome back to the show. This is going to be a good one because it is a show that was pre-endorsed by you folks out there. Uh, a couple episodes ago, uh, Cameron talked about Cameron Weiss of the Weiss Watch Company. Uh, check out, by the way, their new 38 millimeter standard issue field watch. $950. Shazam! It's fire. Of course, check me out on Instagram the smoking tire so anyway cameron was at uh e p h j yes is that correct e p h j which stands for again i have no idea you have no idea <laughs> not you have, uh, like, it none stands idea? for um yeah i have no idea something in french or something in french french or swiss yeah and it's it, basically it is a show where watchmakers can go and like like a car person like SEMA or CES would be it or yeah equivalent yeah exactly um, you're not so much gonna see any you're not gonna see any finished watches you're gonna At see all. parts of watches and you're gonna see machines that make parts of watches and you're gonna see uh, people who are craftsmen behind the making of certain things or the assembly of certain things but you're not gonna see finished watches it's not like Basel World where you go in and, and see the, the finished Rolexes for that year or uh, go into a booth and you see just finished watches from a brand. Mm-hmm. This is all about actually making watches and also making um, uh, medical devices. 
Oh, they put so, so they put watches and medical devices together. Yeah, it's the very similar type of manufacturing and assembly that goes into making watches as goes into medical devices. Like when you say like is it going to be like uh like robotic shit? Is that what we're talking about here? There'll be some robotic stuff mm-hmm. and then there will be some stuff like Gioche. Oh, totally okay. antiquated equipment and uh just all about craftsmanship. Uh, but you'll also see robots polishing things and robots making watches. So it's it runs the gamut from the regular kind of watchmaking of assembling with hand tools and making watches in that old fashion, um, and also brand new, the really advanced, really stuff. advanced stuff that cool. you'll see in the major like uh, manufacturers where they're making millions of watches a year. All right. Well, you brought back a bunch of video from this, so that's yeah. that's the the point is that you went to it actually with the mindset that people were interested in seeing more about it. So you actually got a bunch of video. Some of it looks vertical. A lot of it looks it's vertical. All, it's all on my phone, so it's he all kind of weird. Format. No one has told Cameron to turn his phone sideways when shooting video. There you yet. go. I'm not a pro. That's a thing that you do. I'm a watchmaker. You're I don't a know how fucking to use broadcaster now, sir. <laughs> You're a watchmaking well, next broadcaster. Next time, um, but I will you fix that. So you brought back like uh, pictures and video, and some of it is interspersed. So, what do you think? Should we just just pull, should we just go with video? Um, pull some stuff up, and I can explain All what's right. going we're on. Gonna look at, we're gonna look at some some shit. Yeah, we're gonna look at some gear. And where did it go? Huh? Hopefully, we didn't freeze. No, we're good. No, no, we haven't. We haven't frozen. We although, well, quick t- there quick time had frozen. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> hang on, we'll try that. We'll try that again. Uh, no. Okay, here we, here we go, folks. So, pardon our, um, pardon our uh, vertical video ness. What are we looking at here, Cameron? This is actually a polishing machine, and it's polishing what looks like a Royal Oak bezel. So, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore bezel. So, we're looking at a spinning polishing wheel on the left side, and then a robot arm that is what programmed to. Move this bezel the same way every time? Yep, move to... And it's programmed for that specific shape of the AP bezel. Um, So you're actually getting straight graining in just the right way without having to do it by hand. At the AP... at If you actually go to Audemars Piguet, you're going to see them using hand tools to achieve that same finish. So would AP buy a machine like this? Or doesn't doesn't part of what makes an AP an AP that they're not using this type of machinery? That is part of it, yes. But other people that maybe want to produce a watch that is really highly finished like an Audemars Piguet, but not uh-huh. made by hand like an Audemars Piguet, they could introduce some really cool finishing techniques and do it in an automated fashion like this and keep the price of their watch still low. Oh, how interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for, this, for, the, for a company like Oris, like we talked <clears throat> about, mm-hmm. they could buy one of these machines and start you know, upping their finishing game uh, without really increasing the cost of the finishing because they don't have to hire a whole bunch of really skilled artisans to do the polishing work. Oh, okay. So this is another uh, another machine. Looks like a belt. Uh, a, uh, looks like a static belt sander yeah, of some so it's, kind. It's actually the same machine, which is putting the straight grain on the front surface of that Audemars Piguet mm. bezel mm-hmm. or Audemars Piguet style bezel. Uh, so all in one machine. It just did all of the facets on the bezel with the straight grain, and now it's doing the straight grain on the front surface of the bezel. That's neat. Yeah. How cool. And wait, let me see if I have... Is this the same machine here? New machine. New machine. So here you can see that kind of bezel part. Oh, yeah, down at the bottom of the screen here. That's what the other machine just made, right? Yep. Okay, so then play this. Now what's this machine going to do? So that machine is automatically loading uh, the actual machine that is running oh okay so that's yeah. the part that just got finished mm-hmm. and yeah. it's being pulled out of the machine and placed on a tray and it's grabbing another one and it's going to start doing the same polishing operation on that part oh cool so now a person doesn't even need to chuck that part up in the machine there's a robot so a person just puts a tray into the robot cell of these raw parts yeah and at the end of however many uh, minutes or hours those cycles take it's done 
they pull the tray out and it's finished. Bro, Mexicans are not taking your jobs. <laughs> Robots are taking your fucking jobs, dude. Yeah. That we're, what we're looking at is three people's jobs gone, right? Uh, more than that. I don't want to take a downer stance on it, but that yeah. is pretty much what we're looking at here is the uh, automating and eliminating of jobs. Yeah. Which, I mean, all right, I guess. If it means you can make more APs, like, sure. Uh, all right, what do we have here? So this, you can see a bracelet end link actually in there, and uh-huh. it's being transferred by this robotic arm. So is this machine making end links, and then the arm is pulling them out? This or? is just the polishing of it. Oh, this so right whole now thing it's is doing just a little, polishing end links. Yeah, it's doing a little cutting operation, uh-huh. um, and then it, it'll touch up on this sandpaper, the green sandpaper, and put a straight grain on it. Oh, wow. How about that? Yeah. This is the kind of stuff that companies like Rolex utilize. Right, right, right. Where they're making over a million watches a year. and Rolexes are all machine-made, right? Yeah. Are there hands on that at all? There are hands on it. However, it's very limited. Is this mine? This is yeah. Mine. Okay. It's very limited hands-on, and it's all assembly line style, mm-hmm. uh, but automated wherever possible to keep it efficient and make sure that their quality controls can be maintained properly. So here, so this guy, this uh, arm just just in, dropped off and picked up a new end link. Yeah. Put it in the other arm, and then this looks like a, a Dremel tool of something, right? Is doing yeah. some little cuts, and then it moves over to the side, and gets a little sandpaper. Yeah. Cool. What does what a machine like this? Do you talk pricing with these people? Yeah, what does a machine so like this cost? A machine like this costs about half a million dollars. Fuck. Um, so it's that's like a very person's, basic. A person's salary for ten years. Yeah, when you when you set it up for your parts, it'll end up costing you around seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Wow! Properly uh, tooled up. the The big catch to that is that you cannot polish with automation without grinding first. You just can't okay. get a good enough surface finish. Uh-huh. So parts that are like just cut and made, you cannot take them straight to the polishing machine automated. So you have to buy a grinding machine. Uh, you have machine. to buy a grinding machine. And, and how much is a grinding machine? grinding machine is another half a million dollars. Shit. So you're well over a million dollars in order to automate polishing. So really, it's only for the companies that are doing huge, huge volumes, and they just simply would not be able to find enough skilled people to polish. Right. They just don't exist. Yeah. So they There automate. aren't enough polishers to satisfy Rolex's polishing yeah, demands. It's not possible. They would have to have schools uh, operating all the time just to train people to to keep up with the number of watches. They Why make. don't they? We need some jobs, right? It it would be nice. Yeah. But What's the okay? So you spend seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on a polishing machine, which then requires you to spend another what four hundred on a grinding machine. Yeah. So you're now at uh, eleven five. Yeah. Right or a mil a million one fifty. How many people's jobs have you eliminated with that process? Uh, I. Thousands, I would imagine. What eliminating do you mean? The, the, like these two machines are eliminating thousands of people's jobs because of the volume they can do. A person can only polish a watch, uh, depending on which watch it is, maybe thirty minutes at the quickest. The quickest they could do it would be thirty minutes per watch. Why can the robot do it so much faster? Because they don't have to ever check itself. It's just perfect every time, right? Yeah, it's perfect every time. Shit. Uh, and it's just. You have a known input and a known output. This may seem like a dumb question, but like I'm trying to find out, like why is a robot so much faster at polishing than a person? Like if it's known that four seconds is the correct amount, you know what I mean? So you also have things being handheld. Right. So you don't know how much pressure is being put on the part if you're hand holding it up against a buffing wheel to polish it or to do a straight grain. You don't know if you might be slightly angled. So it'll take a human they might have to do something twice, maybe two, three times right. even, in order to get it perfect, whereas yeah. the robot does it once. As long as you know the input to that cell was uh, up to the tolerances that you needed for it to come out perfect. So it's... Uh, you There's some engineers with, that are like, Farrah, you're retarded. Why are you even asking? It's so obvious. But like, I, you know, it changes. It changes the skill set. Because before you needed a room with 20 polishers. Now you need an office with... A couple of really skilled engineers and programmers yeah. who can actually run these machines. So it, it takes it from watchmaking to more of like a computerized engineering right. type of thing, um, which is necessary for mass production of watches, high volume. And of course, you could do all of this stuff in low quality production too, 
where you don't care necessarily as much and you're just running it as fast as possible. Mm-hmm. You're not trying to get the best finish. Um, you think couple Oh, so like, it's like uh, your printer, fastest, best quality, like you have the, that setting in a machine like this? Uh, you won't have settings like that, but it's just how you set it up. Yeah. Um, you oh, if you set the thing to move super, super slow versus yeah. really cranking and it. And you're yeah, really right, precise right, with mean. everything and make yeah. sure everything's perfect. Uh, it'll slow down all it your programs. It doesn't have a speed quality slider you can yeah. just... <laughs> yeah. It's like if you want good surface finish on a lathe or yeah. a mill, you have to slow down your program. Right. You'll, it'll take you longer to achieve a better surface finish, uh, which like for us... We machine our parts. We do not grind them, so they're machined. Like our watch case will be will be on a cut on a mill turn, and then we hand polish it. So it's hand taped, masked uh, to mask certain surfaces that we right. polish first. Then we do brush finishing, and all of it's done by hand. It takes a long time. Yeah. Um, well, you said every watch has like thirty hours in it or something. It's more than that. It's yeah, quite charge. a bit more you than need, that. You need to charge more. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what is what is this here? Let's see. We got this is a a tray of those end links. So that's those oh. the end links before they're loaded into the machine. Oh right. For the so just right polishing. here. Yeah. Okay. That's a quickie video. So the idea Sorry. is you could actually have your your milling machine cutting those end links and, and then just dropping them dropping them, in the them onto that tray, and then right. this robot is selecting them, orienting them the right way, right? Placing them into a different holder setup. There he goes. Here's the robot just yeah. dropped one in the tray, and now he's going into a different tray. And these are randomly placed. Those, are, yeah, they're not in order. They're just like scattered about a conveyor belt, like as if they just came off a conveyor belt and yeah. dropped, right? So, oh, so it's going. That's the grind, and then the polish, right? It looks like it just took. It picked up a link, and what it did is it, it set it down, it and something. then it, all it did was it set it down. To re reor- to make it oriented the proper way because it was flipped upside right. down. So here we so the- slow mo. Look, yeah. I'll pull it through slow mo. So here now here's a random pile of end links or not end links. Excuse me, just links on the ground. So it grabs one, picks it up, moves, and it puts it down in this little sort holder. of holder, like a little mini vice, and then it reorients itself, grabs it the right way, and moves on. Yeah, fuck. That's All cool. of this oh, to just so avoid cool. having people. It's amazing. <laughs> well, all right. What do we have here? This is a. This is a, a pretty cool machine, actually. This is for high polish. Oh, neat! And you see, it's able to polish, not only with the the wheel being stationary, uh, or the part being stationary. Right. The part can actually rotate as it's being touched to the buffing wheel. So it's a a <laughs> buffing wheel on a swivel arm. It yeah. looks like it can get any angle, and then also a spinning mount for what appears to be they're polishing like a, just a marble, like a casino ball, like yeah. a roulette ball, basically. Yeah, so you could do a high polish on a round surface without yeah. putting flat spots on it. Yeah. Um, like the bezel of our watch, we have to constantly rotate it uh-huh. as we're polishing it. Otherwise, we'll make a flat spot on the bezel. That's really cool. Yeah. Oh, man, you found you did find some good shit. You found some, some winners here. Is this the same thing? Uh, yes. Oh, wait. Sorry. No, you're you're a new video. There we go. So this one, so this, you can okay. load multiple. You have these that are oh, rotating through man. there, and you load one on there, and yeah. then it rotates into the back, and there's a buffing wheel in the back. Oh, this is like one of those big uh, smokers that has a big like multi-tray rotisserie yeah. on it. Yeah, where it's spinning them and rotating them so around. You, and you can unload and load safely right. with a person. Um, or you could have a robot, I guess. Yeah, doing so a, that. a per, yeah, a person or a robot is constantly mounting like cases yeah. or whatever, and taking onto the this polished thing. ones off. Yeah, and that's actually a dial that's on one of those. Um, you can do things like the uh, those sunburst patterns on a mm. dial that, that radiate out from the center. Mm-hmm. That that's can be really, achieved on a, a yeah, dial. You, oh, it's so cool, man. Yeah, that's some good stuff. This is so. This is the grinding machine. This is the oh, machine is you the need grind. to buy in order to prep the watch case for polishing, uh, for automated polishing. I'm sorry, you did a sucky job with video of this. <laughs> <laughs> this looks like a more like a standard uh, CNC type machine where a part is held still and a drill bit sort of moves around it. Yeah, well, that drill bit it's actually cutting the crown holes, the oh, the hole for the, uh-huh. the stem, uh-huh. and also there's the ability to drill the holes. For your, uh, for your lugs. straps for right. the lugs, yeah. How do they? Oh, I get. How do they get 
Well, like so here, my watch, the, there's they're not all the way through. Yeah. How do you drill the holes from the inside? So you actually have to come with a long drill bit and go in at an angle, slight angle. Really? Yeah. Oh, I I would have not guessed that. Wait. Yeah. So those holes inside the lugs are actually drilled at a very slight angle. I'll hold my watch up and. I and would have show thought you. it was some kind of like a differential. So you Here, you want to have you have an overhead projector. Oh yeah. So the case is fixed, and then you will come in with a drill at an angle like this into the lug. That's so. That does not seem like the way to do it, because the 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 push bars have to go straight in. Now Rolex actually has a flexible drill shaft. Yeah. See, that's what I, I figured there would be either a flexible drill shaft or that it would look like the differential yeah, right of angle. a rear wheel drive car. Yeah. And that exists. Zzz, you know what that I mean? That exists and all of those things probably another half a million dollars. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Figured so most of the time somewhere. we just put a little angle there and, and drill the hole. Interesting. I'm I'm surprised that yeah. the um the spring bars don't like come out. They're not affected. Uh the angle is so slight. Huh. Yeah. What about that? Yeah. What are we looking at here? This is uh some quality control equipment. Oh, so it's so, uh, like a micrometer, like a like, right? Uh, well, it'll be measuring a bunch of things. We've got a chronograph on the machine right now. That looks sort of like a Daytona bezel, kind of. I can't really see exactly. Uh, what it is. This was a tag. Oh, okay. Yeah, tag Carrera. Okay. Um, so it's hitting the start stop reset. And oh, it's testing the chronograph. Oh, yeah. cool. So it won't actually like test the timing or anything like that of the chronograph. But what it's going to do is it's going to show you the force for required the button for the buttons, and it's going to do this a lot right. on this watch. So you can have it set to do, you know, a hundred thousand uh, uh, start stop resets, right, right, right. whatever you need to do, and it'll graph the change in the pressure required to see if you can actually wear out the parts or maybe overheat them from start stop reset too quickly right all sorts of that's cool at, at first stuff. when i saw this i thought what it was doing was measuring the case oh i didn't see that it was pressing buttons and i figured it was like it moves out you know four millimeters and that you know that's the right measurement but no it's yeah. pressing buttons cool oh that's so fun that's a good one how many times do you think they would test uh, a chronograph start stop reset is it like a thousand a hundred thousand it depends because a lot of times you're using buttons that have existed before so it's a design that's already been created mm -hmm. and you're pulling it and maybe just changing the outside shape of the button making it square making it larger round but the mechanics of it have gone unchanged for 20 years right if you come up with a totally new design for the the button, maybe it's a larger shaft or a different O-ring or a stronger spring, then they'd go through many, many thousands of cycles hmm. in order to determine whether it wears properly or not. Uh, if you're just maybe receiving them from the manufacturer and you want to test the quality, you might go through 100 cycles or something oh, okay. on every certain number of parts. Interesting. Yeah. Then what do we have here? This is just an interesting oh, milling machine. This is a terrible video. That I camera. stumbled up to the machine. The, sorry. Were you wasted? That was a bad video. I should, that I might have been edited. after the champagne. You know what? I should have edited I should have edited your videos. So this one Is uh, this the correct milling machine? No, no. This is a cleaning machine. This is a blender. Right? It could be. This is actually a cool mill uh, oh, cleaning cool. machine. Wait, so are there watches mounted on the inside this these baskets here? You'll have watch parts. Oh hell yeah. And this one I thought was really cool because as watchmakers, uh we're pretty limited as far as the cleaning equipment we can get. Uh -huh. And every watchmaker, even the little private watchmaker in his own workshop, needs a cleaning machine to yeah. clean watches in for service. Uh, and there's only like a handful of them that exist that you can buy. And this was one I hadn't seen before. Um, and it's also got a pretty large capacity. So when I thought it was pretty interesting. When we went to uh, visit Ulysse Nardin, they had a massive cleaning. Yeah. That looked like bigger, like... Like a huge version of uh, like a restaurant dishwashing machine, right? That was really big and had these really big baskets, and they'd make these parts and run all the parts through the. Those through will the be more like traditional ultrasonic tanks, where it yeah. moves from tank to tank. Right. This one's all in one unit, so it's good for a smaller watchmaking shop. That's really cool. What right? is? I'm sorry, this in the windows here. What is um? What does something like this cleaning machine go for? Uh, I don't know what a, the price on this is, but I know the the more expensive ones that we see here in the U.S. could be like twenty thousand dollars. Okay. Um, more reasonable would be a few thousand dollars. 
That's uh, fairly heavy duty. Yeah, all the equipment is very specialized for watches. A lot of it doesn't cross over to other things, and if it does cross over, it crosses over to medical, medical. and that's which is even also, more expensive, yeah, probably extremely expensive. Okay, so this one, oh, I'm on the wrong window here. Check this out. This one looks like some kind of a CNC mill. Yeah, so this is actually a measuring uh, tool. Oh, this one's doing what I thought the last one yeah, was doing. Okay, exactly. Yeah. And I just, I like the way that it's actually moving the probe around on these like arms at the top. Yeah. It's, it's got, a probably fast got, it's way probably to probe. got more like range of motion that way. Yeah. Yeah, really but super cool. compact machine working very fast. So In this order, is a QC machine. Uh, this is for metrology. What so, is, what measurement. is metrology? Measurement. Oh, okay. So not necessarily... It's part of the QC process, but this is only for measuring. Uh, Sorry. These are just some different fixtures you could that set was a up one, on that, that machine. That was a one-second video. I can't... I'm not even going to attempt to play a one-second <laughs> video. Alligators. Dyed gator. There you go. So everything from, like, the really technical stuff to watch straps. Dyed gator. Right? Yeah. It's weird when it's, like, still the shape it, of an the, alligator, yeah. but it's, like, it's yellow. yellow. <laughs> Like, <laughs> so right? weird. Yeah. What? What? How? So, are do you buy it by Gator? How do you buy this material? It depends. Do you order a series of Gators. So, if you're a company that makes straps, uh -huh. that you make your own straps, then yeah, then yeah, you'll go out and you'll buy it by Gator, or you will farm it. There oh. are. I think it's uh, Hermes has has a Gator. LVMH pretty much has uh, all the farms tied up. They they kind of have a monopoly on the the gator farms. On the gator farms, yeah, that's awesome. So you're pretty much limited to buying from them. That's so funny. I'm gonna uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just fill the screen with videos. Yeah, yeah. See. What we got here. This is uh, this here. These are just s some different components that are made by a a workshop where mm -hmm. they just focus on milling of small components. Anything from bridges, main plates. Uh, oh my god! How do you all tell, these like, tiny the little problem parts? Is all these parts like they're like microscopic, but they're also nice. Like, how do you go? Oh, your microscopic parts are way better than this other guy's microscopic parts. Like, right? What, do you walk around with a loop like an asshole looking at this stuff? Yeah, you, you do, you, don't you? You look very closely at things. You walk around with a little loop, um, and also you have to ask about what kind of tools they have. Uh huh. Because some of the these tools making their shit is a is a whole other thing. Yeah, it's if they have nice tools, they can get nice stuff. If they have crappy tools then you never know if maybe that was the nicest thing they ever made on that right. crappy tool, and they'll never be able to meet that standard again. What is this really cool part looking here that looks like a, a, a Enkai wheel? I think that is an oscillating weight, um, so the rotor of a watch. Yeah. And it looks it's round, but underneath they probably bolt the actual yeah. mass to it. That's cool. On one side. <clears throat> and what? then there's a few different bridges and main plates. These are some main plates that they had made. And then some tiny little jewels that will be pressed into those main plates. So those these so you can see these that. are the jewels. Yeah, and you can see they actually make stuff at this booth. They make stuff for Tag Heuer. Um, you can see on this bridge there, it's got a marking on it. Oh, I didn't for yeah, Heuer. I did not zoom in. In fact, there. that watch you put on, I think that's the. Oh, same is that movement. what that is? Yeah. The caliber O one. Yeah, Crowning Caliber so. sent me a crowl, a caliber O one among some other racing watches to wear, and I would like to wear it, but it has a awful strap on it i'm thinking about maybe taking it home i have other straps at home maybe i'll just put a different strap on it myself yeah um so these are are these screws here so uh, i think those are screws? just rocks oh. just for display purposes well, what, who nice. wants to put uh, rocks in between when you also have other tiny parts people right? are like oh what are these and yeah. they're like uh, those are pebbles sir <laughs> <laughs> and then uh little pieces yeah so these are pieces that have not been cut out they've been wire edm'd out of a solid piece of material, and then they will be cut out completely. So look at this so one right there. So what are we looking at? Oops, sorry, I'm going to pause that. That little guy. Sorry, I apologize. I'm not doing a good job. Right here, yeah, which is, what, like, what is that? I, I don't know which movement that's from, but it's either like a tourbillon cage. It might be for uh, the MB&F with the, no, not the MB. It's something with a raised oh, like dome in it uh -huh. with the balance wheel oscillating within it oh like out front yeah it could be one exactly. of those horological machine things yeah. yeah that's cool it's just like tiny little so that was machined from a block yeah that was machined on an actual awesome. milling machine uh a mix of wire edm and and milling on that one dude that's so cool all right what is this this is another inspection machine so once you have all those parts you have to be able to actually look at them and say we made exactly what we 
intended to make. So, so all is these, this the part here, or this red thing? Yeah, these are some gold? different examples of a part. Right now, it's measuring that that piece of sheet metal that's been stamped. But the parts on the side that it could also measure, you see an Audemars Piguet case right there. Yeah. Um, you see an you see a rotor, weight, uh, main plates. So is so, it laser measuring or is it touching? I can't. It's tell. all visual. It's all visual. It can also grab those probes that are on the side. <coughs> Yeah. And touch the parts to measure. Oh, the but probe it, that was here. Yeah, oh, so, so yeah, this tools. guy up here is actually a, is a probe. Yeah, so oh, it does cool. it both with visual and with probing. And it's very important because we can make parts that are almost impossible to measure. Just so, because the tools, you know, without the, the human eye can't, like, you just can't do it. Yeah, exactly. Fitting calipers into a certain area is just not possible. So at our workshop, we actually have a, a measuring microscope where we can visually inspect uh, our parts that we manufacture and measure them all with a program similar to this one. It doesn't have a touch probe, but it's all done visually without touching the part. Huh, that's yeah. so cool. Here's this thing that's like a, it's a big glass globe. Yes. Uh, you look excited. What is this? It's a very cool piece of equipment for a watchmaker. Um, so what's it doing? This is actually, this is uh, vibrating hairsprings. Oh, cool. This is, is that what's happening here? Yeah, this center? is one of the hardest parts of making movements, is pairing your hairspring with your balance wheel, because the balance wheel weight has to match the weight of the hairspring. Okay. The weight of the hairspring. Let me clear some of this out. Means awful. How quickly it oscillates back and forth based on how thick it is. Which and gets which controls your beat rate, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. So think of a, a pendulum. If you make the weight at the end of the pendulum heavier or lighter, you change the rate. Right. If you also make the length of the string that it's hanging on longer or shorter, you change the rate. So this, what this machine can do is actually figure out exactly what rate that paired balance and hairspring are at, and you can switch out different little tooling things uh -huh. to cut the spring into shorter, uh, shorter lengths. Oh, how cool. You can also cut some material from the balance wheel, all sorts of stuff, because if you machine a balance wheel, that's not good enough. Yeah. How are you going to actually pair it to a spring and make it keep rate properly? Yeah. Really neat. And I, I imagine the glass globe is just there to keep dust off it. Yeah, it keeps dust off it. And also what it's doing is uh, that little hose that is going there is actually blowing air on the balance wheel oh. to get it to start moving. Oh, cool. Yeah, neat. Yeah. That's fun. Wow, you got you, you found some fun stuff with this. This is like a nerd's paradise here. Oh, yeah. This is another measuring machine where you can see it's measuring these features which that would be where the stem goes into the watch this is where plate. the stem the stem goes through yeah. the plate yeah cool i'm glad you have a mind for this sir i'd be <laughs> lost uh let's see this one this was at the uh Berjan booth mm -hmm. and Berjan is a maker of tools mm -hmm. and they also buy tools from other companies and put their branding on it and sell it through their catalog they're like a watchmaker supply company oh cool so all of these are they're examples of tools that Bergen either makes or they sell um, so for the watchmaker. A, a stocked bench, yeah, as just it were. stocked with all kinds of hand tools. A lot of that stuff I have in my workbench at home or at the workshop. Yeah, at home is not I, at home. Yeah, this was pretty rad. Is it perlage. Punching? What's it doing? This is doing perlage, uh, automated perlage. Oh, so it's making the dots on the yeah. uh, on the in the bridges. Yeah, and if you think about it, so the nice thing about handmade watches is they're all unique. Mm -hmm. If you start to do the the perlage with a machine, each perlage dot is identical to the next one. Right, right, right. So you can actually go in there and program in some differences. You can say make this one a little weaker here, or you know, you can add a mathematical yes, equation. I like so the mathematical randomness. Exactly. You you add a little random mess up on some of the parts. Fuck yeah, I'm about that. Yeah. So you can do that, or you can go in and manually do like one dot and mess it up or can something. Can you program like the guy's having some problems at home? <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this guy had too much coffee and he was right. shaky. We'll put that in the program. It's like, a, oh, it's for Panerai? Oh, yeah, we need a Friday afternoon uh, siesta programmed into this thing. Right. That's funny. So normally that would be done by hand. You right. have like a tool that you're pressing down by hand and rotating the disc, mm -hmm. um, which leads to very often you'll have a little mix-up 
at least a difference between the pressure on each dot. Uh-huh. So this is this is my dream right here. This is your dream right here? This is an assembly line. This is a workbench that actually moves the parts from one side of your bench to the other side of your bench. <laughs> so as you <laughs> are assembling, yeah, yeah. instead of having to like get up and grab the parts from uh-huh. the the drawers where we store them, the parts come to you. You have like one thing of screws, and on this assembly line, the parts come to you, and they pop up right here in Ugh. this little black dome in the center. And then the fin- the somewhat finished part goes to the one side, uh-huh. and then it comes back. It shuttles back the other way. You add the next parts, and you just keep shuttling it back and forth. You don't even have to get up. That's awesome. It's These screwdrivers <coughs> here uh, are actually torque screwdrivers. So, so they uh, will torque to just the right specification uh, on each screw. Yeah. So it, I remember seeing these at car factories, actually. They yeah. do them when they, they'll put on a door or something and go, beep, beep, yeah. beep, 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 and it, you know when they're done. Yeah, that it's way awesome. you, you know that maybe uh, you know one watchmaker is a little weaker than the other one and mm-hmm. they don't torque the screws as much. This way you know that they always get torqued to the same value. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I like when the parts <laughs> come by and pop up from the desk. That's right? dope, yeah. This is very cool as well. This is automatic oiling by contact. Wow. So this machine is oiling eight movements at a time that are on a tray. So someone just puts a tray of eight movements. Mm-hmm. So here's the screen, the zoomed in. I imagine the static in, fo- in focus here is your oiling needle, right? Yeah. So the, the thing that's not moving is the oiling needle, uh-huh. which comes up to a pivot. It places the oil where it needs to be. Right there. Right there. It, it, uh, dis- it puts the it oil in there. <laughs> Um, That's like such a tiny amount of oil, too. Yeah. It's so little oil that it moves. It does its next one. So if it's doing eight at once, does it have... It doesn't have eight needles going at a time. It's just going one at a time through the eight, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So each one of these has a different <clears throat> oil in it. Right. Different uh, viscosity. Like certain parts need certain oil, other parts need other yeah. oil. Yeah. So I have little little jars with oil in them and a little hand oiler, which is like a needle that I pick the oil up and I place it where it needs to go on each movement. Yeah, and didn't you say the this oil's the like $1,000 an ounce or something? Right, it's very expensive. <laughs> yeah. For certain Certain oils are very expensive. The yeah. ones we use very little of. Which oil, what oil does that do <laughs> use very little of it for? Uh, that would be for the escape wheel uh-huh. and the pallet fork. There's a special oil that when the two parts are colliding and there's movement, it becomes liquid. When they separate, and they're not touching and colliding with each other, it's solid. And that's how many times a second? Uh, that would be like 15. There's usually about 15 to 20 teeth on a wheel, uh, and you've got a beat rate of like 28,000 uh, per hour. Yeah, so it's a bunch. So it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so that oil needs to be really high-quality stuff. Yeah. This and is another setup where it just does one movement, but it does it all at once. Oh, All the wow. oil at one time. Just poof, Rotates. Poof. And Flip the movement and do the other side. This is actually probably, this is a less, this is a step down from that last one, right? Yeah. And then you've got fluid dynamics. So measuring the amount of oil that goes, that's Uh, put on each pivot. Yeah. You can either do it by uh, like the volume. Uh Uh-huh. Or or it's, there's true volume or there's pressure and time. So true volume is very expensive. Doing it by pressure and time is a little less money, but not as accurate. Geology is a study of pressure <laughs> and time. Uh, and then this is... Oh, it uh, moves a whole tray of stuff around. Yeah, so this is a, an automated press that is actually pressing jewels and pins into bridges. Cool. So the locating pins, after you've machined the bridges... Is it the me bridges, or does it look like this... It Really, the way this is shot looks like this punch is going through glass. Uh, it is. There's a little hole in the glass. Oh, seriously? It is yeah. going through the glass. Okay, it's yeah. not just an optical illusion. Yeah, because the whole time you don't want dust right. to be settling on your parts as you're working right, on them. Right, right, Wow. Yeah. So, And this, again, this is like major factory stuff. You'll see this in the Edda factories right. where they're doing massive assembly. You'll see this in Rolex. This is laser cutting of watch hands. Oh. So there's a laser here with those metal kind of wires going to it. Uh-huh. And there is some sheet brass that is moving around as the laser, the laser is stationary. And the bottom part with the sheet brass will actually move around with the outline of those hands. How cool. Yeah. 
That's so neat. You really and most watch hands are usually going to be stamped uh, or laser cut. This this is a machine that I'm looking into for our workshop. Oh, really? This is a an, a more automated way to burnish pivots. Okay. When we make a, a pinion, we actually have to polish and burnish the ends of it that actually contact the jewel. Like the tiniest the little... The tiny little ends. It's like a hair, right? It's, yeah, it's it's like a couple of human hairs in diameter. <laughs> so so crazy. these rotating discs, what you do is you place the pinion in between those, right, and then right the rotating here. discs come down, yeah. and they touch. So if this... There, well, in this case, it moves up, right? It moves up yeah, to meet the disc. Exactly. It's moving so up there. The person just places the the pivot like this. Yeah. So here, wait, here, if wait. you're polishing, let me give you a camera here, so you know. Here you go. Oh, you want the here? Oh, here. All right. You want that <laughs> camera? Yeah. Pick your camera. So if the silver part is the pinion that needs polishing, it would go down like that, okay. and then the disc comes down on the top and spins to polish it, right. and this will just start to rotate with it and polish it. So the the person just has to place the pinion there, and it can do it automatically and get everything nice and perfect um, in a relatively easy fashion. Right now, we use something that is definitely not as easy and not as quick. It's a smaller version of this machine where we're actually lowering the, the grinding carbide down onto the pinion and setting everything with micrometers. But it's all manual. All manual, yeah. basically. This but seems, this would make it that seems like more that would repeatable. Streamline the process yeah. there. Oh, this looks like neat. I like these purple hoses or whatever this is. This is right? fun. So the the purple hoses are coolant, and this would actually have a hose full of pinions. No person loading the pinions into the machine. Oh wow! There's a tube full of these pinions that have been machined, and it would automatically wow. load them, do the burnishing, and then or pull also. Them out. It might just be blanks, and it'll cut the wheels into the pinion, the teeth into the pinion as well, oh, and the then burn it. Could wow, do that's the whole shit. Wow, the whole thing at once. Crazy. Yeah, that's so cool. This has got this. I bet that's expensive. Yeah, you're looking at about a million dollars for that machine. What's the lifespan of a machine like that? Uh, very long time. Yeah, very long time. Yeah. Wow, I hope so for a million dollars. Yeah. This is oh whatever oh that's just a cool video of gears in action isn't it? So those gears you see the wheels placed within the holes inside the gears. <laughs> yeah. So what it's doing is it's lapping those gears to a very perfect uh, flatness on on both sides, and also putting a uh, surface finish on there that's perfect. Wait 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 okay so what you're looking at here it, is it an... grinds them to the right thickness. Where is the grinding happening? Against the surface it's rolling that, around that on? White the white surface is actually an abrasive. Uh, a, oh, it's a just, very mild it's just using a gravity, its own gravity, yeah. to kind of rub them against sandpaper. And this actually, the top part, you put that down on top of it. Oh, and you get the so double. So both sides grind right. at once. That looks like a brake rotor. Right? Exactly like a brake rotor. And the idea of that circular motion in two different ways, you know, like right. it's rotating as it's spinning. Yeah. Um, that will get you... A more flat surface. Uh huh. Wow, it's a teacup ride. Yeah, in mechanics. Yeah, is what it is. You guys found some really neat stuff. This uh, this little machine here actually, it cuts winding stems to length. So what happens is a movement manufacturer makes all their winding stems the same length. They're all long. The company that buys the movement will actually, or just the stem, will cut the stem to the right length to fit their case. And then they will Loctite the crown onto it. This machine does all of that automatically. Cool. It, it will automatically cut the, the stem. Cuts the st here's a cut stem. And it'll grind and the end of it. Here's a crown. And then they mash them together to make this. Yep. That's so cool. One yeah. machine. Yeah. Dude, there's some dope, dope stuff here. Oh, this one might be... This one's 12 seconds. This is a record long for you. Uh, yeah, this will be <laughs> some more metrology. So, it's so you can see on the case. screen the part that it's measuring... And then here are probes, and it's actually touching the outsides of that part. And then the measurements so come up virtually here. Yeah, so what you do is you can take your CAD files, put it in the computer, and you can put the part that you made on the mill based off those CAD files and see how close it is. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's a mill accuracy tester, really? Yeah, it, it'll, it'll test... Uh, because if, you, if something's not right, you might machine a part that is slightly oversized or undersized or features might be slightly off and it just doesn't match what you intended. And yeah. then when you go to fit it with the other parts, it's not going to fit. Hmm. 
So that avoids that. This was a pretty cool video system for inspection, and it was really hard for me to, to film it, but you can see um, this part here is actually the hammers of a chronograph in the last part of slamming down onto the, uh, the heart-shaped cams. Oh, wow. But the amount of detail that's how, in that... How like, intense of a microscope is this thing? So it's slow motion as well. Oh, that's so, so it's a running video. chronograph. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. But that movement is tiny. <laughs> yeah. That's $4 million. So <laughs> what that was checking <laughs> is when, you're, when you reset your chronograph, uh -huh. if things aren't lined up properly with the springs in the, the reset, you can actually have a moment where your hands will be at zero, and then they kind of jump away from zero a little bit. Uh-huh. <laughs> Crazy. This oh, was this some the more of that thing. high it's slowing yeah, down, slow motion. Wow! Exactly. So this this is a chronograph oh, reset. That was a right chron there. chronograph reset. Yeah, in super slow. So it shows the hand <laughs> jumping <laughs> and the hammers coming down. And oh, see how they bounce? Yeah. So that's the force that you're wow, watching that your chronograph a... goes through. Wow, that reset. is the violence of a reset. Yeah, that's really neat. Do that one more time. And the reset. Boing, 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 boing. So that's yeah. why sometimes those uh, chronograph second hands yeah, they can get become stuck. loose. Yeah. How about that? What's that this guy, guy I filmed What's this because guy I thought he was going to do something cool and then he did something completely not cool. Really? What did he do that was not cool? Well, all he's doing is hand, like, Grinding putting a satin up. finish on a bracelet with a Dremel tool or something, which I don't think anyone should ever do. Okay. Don't be that maybe, guy. Maybe if you're at home, you could do that as like a quick home fix, but He's no professional should ever do that. He's also got a fairly whack ponytail and a big long lobe yeah. earring happening. I thought he was going to do something very cool, and it turned out just <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> this uh, is a opinion cutting machine, gear hobbing. So it can actually hob stacks of uh, wheels into gears. Oh, cool. Or you can make pinions as well. Wow. So we have our lathe at our workshop our cnc lathe where we can do hobbing on it but this is a dedicated machine for hobbing only so all you would do is load your blank parts in there that have no gear teeth on them and all it does is cut gear teeth as fast as it's the fastest way to cut gear teeth wow basically. that's really cool but now there were now we're in some really weird science so once you've cut those gear teeth and the pinions how do you get your pinions and your wheels together? Well, right now we hand rivet them together. Okay. It's a, a process all done by hand. Um, this is a machine that actually can grab a pinion from one side on the uh -huh. left, maybe, and grab a wheel from the right side, put them in the center, and the press will rivet them together. I and forget the it, specs, and then it but it's like... it grabs it and puts it back over there. Yeah, I forget the specs on that thing, but it's. I, I think it's like... 2,000 an hour or something like that that it can do and riveting pinions can, to wheels. How fast can a human do it? In an hour, I could do like maybe uh, 30. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Bro, you're going to have to outsource yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so we could either spend Holy millions shit, and millions so on idiotic. these machines or we could figure out how to clone watchmakers. That's crazy. This is a, Here's another, another example of these workbenches showing the part actually popping up, the movement in front of you. So actually, I saw this at the Ulysse Nardin factory where uh, it was more assembly line where like one person would just install this wheel. Yeah. And actually, the whole movement would move from station yep. to station like every five minutes. Yeah, so they have a, a set of wheels sitting right. here in front of them, and the yeah. movement comes to them. They put yeah. the wheel, and, and then they press a button, and it goes to the next guy. And then the movement goes to the next guy. Yeah, that this is what they were using in uh, Le Loc. Yeah, so over here on this bench, and you even see on the little iPad-looking thing, exactly the task that the operator is supposed to do pops up on there, like, yeah. oh, place oil right here, Yeah. or whatever it is. And then this machine, the next station, is actually measuring end shakes. So that's how much a wheel moves up and down within the movement. To oh, make that's sure what an everything end shake stays. is called? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Make I sure all the gears term. are still engaged. It's a good name for a band, Yeah. end shakes. Funny enough, this is also how uh, they get sushi delivered for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no? Is that, that's like a Spike, it, it that's a spike Ferriston joke. <laughs> that's a full Spike Ferriston joke. More assembly lines? Yeah, so this uh, is this just is, another angle on that I think this shit is so bench, cool. Right? Is it, uh, is, it on, like, is it like a train? Is it like on rails? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's not Rails. It's like a little. Uh, um, it's a motion system, but not Rails. That's super cool. Yeah. More motion systems. Motion systems. The movement or whatever comes up and just like pops up in front of you. Yeah. So these benches are kind of the thing I would like to add to Weiss Watch Company because it would allow me to be more efficient and also use some technology to check my work. Right. Oh, you that's know? what this guy's. That's what yeah. this thing is doing here. It's exactly. checking checking someone's installation skills. Yeah. Cool. Man, you guys, they, they have some really, really... Building machinery to me is really wild. Like yeah. The 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 making oh, that, that one was nothing. The making of precision equipment. Is this a thing? Uh, yeah, just some straps. The other one was some stamping tools, actually. Strap manufacturer, Silva. So yeah. Silra, Sibra. S- sorry, I can't read. Uh, Sibra. Yeah. Sibra straps. Oh, this was what? Oh, stamping. Yeah. So the big things in there are actually the stamping tools that have to be made. That's what's very expensive. Oh. That could be a hundred thousand dollars in stamping tools. Really? And then you can stamp these parts out. How long does the tool last? How many um, stamps do you get? You would get a lot of stamps. It depends on the material you're using, uh-huh. but you could make millions of parts. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's where a hundred grand comes in. Yeah. A watchmaker's bench. I yeah. love the bench. You get these really right? cool armrests. This is a cool one because it's also got the computer in it. So it's more of like a somebody who's also going to be working at a computer. So mm-hmm. maybe they're quality controlling, and then they're going to enter in the serial number of the watch and say that one passed. Or, right. Um, Different benches. And then here's more of your standard, just a very nicely built watchmaker's bench. It's like the IKEA section yeah. of the... Can you convert a regular desk into a watchmaker's desk, or do you have to start with the special desk? You can start with a regular. Like this this table here, you could watchmake on. It has that high lift thing on it. Yeah, this table works good yeah. because it's, on, it's actually on a riser. You could yeah. do a, we could do a standing podcast if we wanted to, but yeah. fuck that. This kidding. was just a, a really cool-looking vacuum furnace for uh, like heat treating and things like that. For that us. Is, I mean, that's a pretty cool-looking right? piece of hardware. Yeah. So for watchmaking, when we heat treat things, we need to do it in a vacuum at the very least. Oh. If we don't do it in a vacuum, the parts turn black and oh, kind of charred looking. And that's really bad because then you have to polish it and get all of that off of there. Oh, and think so of like polishing the slot of a screw. Yeah. Why would you take a perfectly good screw and then turn it black and charred so that you can polish it again? Yeah. So they do it in a vacuum or you mix it with a white gas. Oh, uh, which you can is mix explosive. it with a white gas. Yeah. Oh, that's why so, you don't do that. Okay. But if you do that, you have really nice, shiny, bright white parts hmm. that come out. Yeah. So what are we looking at here? This is some Zeiss measuring equipment. Same so Zeiss like, as the cameras? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so they do all kinds of optical measurements, and this is a probe measuring tool. But the cool thing here were these fixtures. I that, thought these. Uh, I think these look very cool. They right? Look, they look like tourbillon cages. Yeah, and it's just holding a main plate so that... Basically, every feature can be accessed uh, from either side by that probe at one time. That's very cool. Yeah. More of that? Yeah, just a video of oh, the moving oh, around. Oh, there's the probe actually working? Yeah, so it can probe and, and cut. flip to the other side. This is similar thing, except three parts on the machine at once, and it can probe both sides. So for us, we'll cut like 16 main plates in one shot. Then we flip them over, cut the other side, and then we need to figure out how to measure those. Huh. So this is a good process for measurement because it's very delicate with the parts, and it can do it without someone physically sitting there measuring each part. We can actually we could do the things that are necessary like polishing and uh, jeweling and all these other things that take a lot of time rather than the measurement. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm afraid to ask what the measuring tool costs. A lot. <laughs> Everything's very expensive. I like this because it's called a Fanuc. So the reason I, I took this video <laughs> was because we have a Fanuc Robo Drill. Oh, really? Yeah. Robo Drill is also an awesome name. Is this CN- right? CNC in cases? Yeah. So this is a special tray, and this spindle like setup, I, I haven't showed this one to Grant, who he operates our CNC equipment in our workshop. But I'm sure he'd like this one, um, and I'll probably show it to him to get a little more info on what's going on here. But it was basically able to mill or grind all of these on this pallet system. Uh, and it's made by the same manufacturer that made our mill that cuts our parts for our movement in cases. It's a fucking fanook. Yep. <laughs> it's fucking great. Um, that's cool. And it... Oh, wait, I'm... S- 
I'm just so mesmerized by all this machinery. Right. This thing is just uh, picking up uh, plates and moving them from one place to another. Yeah, robot cell. So this this these plates are machined in the on the far side of that little robot cell. Mm-hmm. There's a machine to mill them, and then you have these trays that it's placing the finished parts onto. Crazy. We're gonna be all out of jobs soon. Right. It's all gonna be the robots. We're all fucking done. This is just a really good fixturing system for placing parts into the mill. You can see a watch case there in the center and how it's being held so that we can mill the outside of it. Oh, that's um, Fixturing cool. of small parts is a big part of watchmaking. Yeah, um, like how do you hold a tiny screw so yeah. you can get at it from this angle? The right angles, yeah. Right. So this is a good system for taking parts in and out of the machine without changing the location of them Uh huh. because the whole fixture comes out and it goes back to a very, very accurate position when you place it back in there. Yeah, like a racing steering wheel that only goes on one way. Yeah, yeah so yeah, like yeah. if you drill a hole and then you want to inspect it before you take that part out and say it's finished, you can take the whole unit out, look at it, measure it, and then put it back in and fix it if it's not right. That makes sense. This looks complicated. This is a, a neat what machine. What is this? So they had it set up doing perlage uh-huh. on, on these plates, but this is kind of the future of... Uh, production for oh my watch God, this bridges. Is, this is such an intense machine. It's uh, they're modules, and you have a module that has all of your blank, your blank pieces of brass. Is that what we're squares. looking at here? These yeah. blank squares of brass. Yeah. So those blank squares are uh, stacked up in these uh, modules, and they will be put in, fed into the machine. They'll go through the machine, and they can go through as many machines as they need. The higher the volume, you add more machines, so you uh-huh. can have one task on each machine. The lower the volume, you might just have one machine, so it does all the tasks. Wow. Um, and then at the end, you, the last module that it goes through will be just storing it back in one of those tubes, uh-huh. but it'll be a finished part at that point. That's crazy. So it's like, it's. I mean, you use the term module, so obviously I'm going to go ahead and guess that it's, it's a modular, modular setup. Ses- yeah. A setup. yeah. So this one. So has all of these modules do a different task, and yeah. then it just gets thrown back into the stack when it's done. Yeah, this has two independent, um, uh, independent spindle operations with four actual spindles. So there's four things being cut. Two of them are different. That's so crazy. Yeah, that seems. I mean, all of this is like. This is not- some uh, some cool polishing gear. Uh, this is more the style of stuff that we use at Weiss. That's a big polishing wheel. Yeah. So these are where you'd actually have a person sitting there holding the part and polishing it, maybe using a fixture to hold it if some of the angles are tight to get into. Um, But just a really nice polishing setup, ergonomic and everything. Um, Mine, I stand at, and (laughs) it's it's taxing on the body. Your back hurts after after a while? It does. These are different fixtures in order to hold things. so a tool like that would be used uh, that, by for, that you mean this thing up the front yeah this video. this like tube looking blue thing with that silver thing on the back it's used to actually hold a case and rotate it as you put that sunburst finish like those omega bullheads that oh, have the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. straight lines radiating on the sides of it the only way to get that is like that huh you need a tool like that and also it's called crevassier yes yeah if you are I'm a watchmaker gonna, looking immature. for a for that tool, they're a good brand for it. What are these like auto, like uh, ultrasonic so, cleaning machines? Yeah, exactly. And the one on the right in there is the one that I have at my workshop. Um, but this one in the center is instead of having a jar or having multiple jars, and the thing goes from jar to jar. Yeah, the fluid is pumped into one jar and oh, then cleaned cool. out and filtered, and then it goes back into so the jar doesn't rotate. There's one jar. How does ultrasonic cleaning work? Uh, what you're doing is you are exploding air bubbles on the surface of the part. So mm. the explosion from the ultrasonic on the surface of the part removes dirt from the really? surface of the part. Can you yeah. clean ultrasonically clean something that's not waterproof? Um, like, a, what do you mean? Well, you're talking about the fluid. Yeah. So, well, so ultrasonic has to be done inside of fluid. You right, so what I'm a, saying a is you have a watch solution. that's not waterproof. You would never want to put a watch in an ultrasonic machine. The ultrasonic waves can go through the case, and it'll actually hit the movement parts, Oh, and it'll cause all your oil to be splattered away 
oh. from the pivots. Oh, so that's... it's really bad to put a an assembled watch into an ultrasonic cleaner. Oh. Just use a toothbrush and some soap and water to clean that. Never put it in an ultrasonic cleaner. That is a good consumer tip. Yeah. I didn't know that at all. Good tip, buddy. These um... are 3D printed parts. So you see some of the trays that were used. There's a big old z- uh, Zenith sample. That's awesome. Right? So some 3D printing of models, but also trays that all those parts can go into. Mm. So it's more about part printing of custom parts for factory yeah, use. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Although there are, I see some watch parts here, too. Yeah. I see both. We're, get, we're getting close to the end. we got f- ooh, five or six videos left. This is just a strap straps, display. Straps and straps and straps. This is uh, this is some true nerdery. Nano um, something or others. So they make taps for threading. Uh, we buy our taps from this company for threading our main plates. Oh. So the just threading is where you can actually taps. put the screws into. Yeah, tiny little taps. And are taps. they they're they're like bits for your presses or you have their hand tools? Um, these are tools that we put into our mill. Okay. So we can we can thread parts on the mill. This is Soprod. What is Soprod? Uh, they're a movement manufacturer that competes with Etta. Oh. Um, or I guess they don't really compete with Etta anymore because Etta stopped selling to a lot of the smaller guys. But uh, how are they their make, movements? They're good movements. A lot of them are copies of Etta. So what they did is they reverse engineered Etta movements, and it's a great plan because they could easily phase into, um, say, a company like Bell & Ross, who mm-hmm. used to use a 2892 for a lot of their watches from Etta. You, you can get a s- similar movement that fits sorry, all folks. their designs and phase it in from Soprod. I'm sorry, I forgot, to, put, without I forgot to bring the video over to the people. We were just looking at it for ourselves. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, so it, it just makes the crossover easy because you can, as a company, you can switch from Edit to Soprod uh, really easy without redesigning all of your watches. Well, pretty soon that will be Weiss. Yes. <laughs> Laborator du Bois. This I just thought was a cool thing. They had This is a, a lapping machine, but they had put a pencil in there to show the pattern of how it's lapping your parts. And what, lapping what is will get lapping? You, it's basically grinding a part to a certain thickness. Oh. But this was like a scientific kind of booth where I think I couldn't really tell exactly what they were doing or selling there, <laughs> but I just like the look of the booth. Uh, it was the very Lib- scientific. Is the Libyans, what? Um, that was a cool display. Just It was all the metal shavings from cutting of... Uh, so Boats are cases, watch mm-hmm. cases. You can see like a Hublot case there, some bracelets there. So this so company just, make just makes cases and bracelets. That's it for yeah. Hublot. Yes. Huh. Oh, and here's a big a big tube full of metal shavings. Yeah. I actually think that's a nice nice piece of art. Yeah. It works. I thought it was a nice uh, nice display. It is, yeah. It is. Where are you? This I thought was hilarious. Chick they, surfing. <laughs> so pratique. they make watch hands this company. But I, I just thought the booth was was very funny. <laughs> I mean, surfing <laughs> has to do with watch hands. It really right? does. And the last video, cases. That compressed yeah. carbon cases. Yeah, so this was a carbon fiber booth where all they do is oh, carbon fiber stuff. These are AP cases. That's that That's that concept, the Royal Oak so concept, actually, right? So actually, this one's the Breitling Avenger. Oh, shit. Or C or Wolf or something like that. That's guessing stuff, yeah. Um, it's a Breitling watch. That's this one here, uh, yeah. yeah. And then you've got uh, Linda Vertolin over here, okay. which is a smaller company. Um, I, f- I recognize this one, but I don't remember who it is. Is it a Panerai that's not been had the thing cut out yet? No, because the lugs are different. I don't know. I don't know either. But yeah, they had some different uh, examples of carbon I would, fibers. I'd fuck with a Weiss carbon case. Right? I like that. Is this wood? Wood case? Um, no, I think... Layered carbon? I think it's layered carbon fiber. That... Sort of looks cool, maybe yeah. not in yellow and black, but right? like it is kind of neat. Yeah, dude, this is really neat, really cool. Like right? so much good machinery in that yeah. in that thing. Did you buy anything? Uh, I haven't bought anything yet. No, it's it's not exactly the show that you just bring a million bucks to no, and, and walk home with a you machine. Didn't, you didn't roll. You don't roll cash to Switzerland. No, <laughs> no. That's great. What? Yeah. Is, so wait, what was the thing you said you kind of wanted to buy? 
Um, I would love to have one of those uh, benches where I can actually move parts in front of me oh, and then yeah. to the other side of the bench and then move them back so that instead of assembling one movement at a time start to finish, I could take like 50 movements mm-hmm. and do one step at a time and they'll move to one side and then they'll move back in front of me and I'll do the next step. And then so at that the end of however... more efficient. Yeah, way more efficient, less moving around, running around. Um, and it'll just make the process easier and easier to quality control too. That seems like something that could actually be worthwhile for you. Yeah. Because like you need to increase your personal efficiency. You don't need to like replace humans yet. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't want to replace humans. That's. I we don't make enough watches, <laughs> and I don't think we ever will make enough watches to to warrant that kind of. Uh, yeah automation that'd be very crazy well that was a i hope that uh you folks enjoyed that uh primer on uh crazy shit that makes watches (laughs) that you can buy at a trade show in switzerland that's wild thank you for doing that and getting all that video next time maybe horizontal yes (laughs) i had no idea i don't do video on cell phones oh boy now now i do now Now you know now i know no more excuses (laughs) sorry guys check out uh weiss watch company on instagram and their new 38 millimeter field watch standard issue uh for under a thousand bucks hell yeah uh what else you want to plug anything else uh no just the new field watch super excited about it there you go we didn't plug them at all this episode but thank you to our sponsor crown and caliber we love you guys uh and we will see you next week thank you for listening to the watch and listen podcast i'm out of here good day